A direct functional assessment observation is something that you do after an indirect FBA. Remember, the indirect FBA are things like interviews and rating scale. Of those, the interview with a teacher or someone who spent time with the student, and if possible, with the student himself or herself, gives you better information. I tend to not use rating scales that much. There's beginning to be more and more research that says that they're very unreliable and don't give you information that's all that useful. So I tend not to spend a lot of time with them. Unfortunately, it's still the primary means by which a lot of school districts do functional behavior assessment. And that's something we'll discuss more in class. So let's say that you do an interview you get some good information about the behavior. You have a good, clear definition of the behavior. You have information about antecedents or situations when the behavior is most likely to occur. And you've got some idea of things that usually happen after the behavior. You use that to develop an initial hypothesis statement, or a summary statement, as we call it sometimes. So the summary statement might be something like, when presented with demands and difficult math tasks, Susie will become disruptive and yell obscenities and push materials off her desk in order to escape or avoid the demand. So that's, that's a hypothesis statement. At this point, we want to collect some direct observational data that's going to help us possibly narrow down antecedents or, uh, or triggers. Um, you know, maybe we've got several that we really can't determine um, which is relevant from our interview information, or we've got conflicting information from two different people. Actually observing the student is going to help us really narrow those things down. Or maybe we have two possible motivations. Maybe in the uh, interview, we can't really tell if the function of the behavior is to escape a demand or to get peer attention. So actually collecting some systematic, well, uh, well-designed observations will help us narrow that down. So it'll help us pick up if there's some setting events that are relevant, what are the relevant antecedents, and what are the consequences that are maintaining the behavior. This is usually going to lead to us changing the hypothesis statement, making it more specific, and hopefully making it something that is going to guide the development of our intervention more effectively. One of the things that we may want to start with is something called an ecological assessment. An ecological assessment is when we look at the environment, or we look at factors in the environment that may affect a behavior. So we may look at, across time, do we see certain settings where we're more likely to see challenging behavior? We also want to pay attention to any situations where we do not usually see the behavior occurring. A lot of people don't realize this, but by looking at situations where we don't see problems, we can compare those to situations where we do see problems, and we can look at the differences between those two settings that can be extremely valuable in helping us understand what factors are associated with some kind of behavioral occurrence. One of the tools that is really helpful is something called a scatter plot. We talked about this in the last presentation, but we'll just look at it briefly here. A scatter plot is essentially just a grid. You divide the day up into time intervals. You can use half hour intervals or sometimes it's more useful to simply break the day down in terms of a student's schedule. And then we indicate in each square of the grid whether or not the behavior occurred during that time. Sometimes we can use a code to indicate more than one occurrences, but that's usually not something that's done with a scatter plot. The goal here is not to get real specific information, but just to identify periods of the day where problems are more likely to happen. So it would look something like this. It's just um, the day divided into 30-minute in uh, intervals. And then for each day, did the behavior occur during that interval or not? So this is really partial interval recording with really long intervals. Of course, partial interval recording means that the behavior occurred at some time during that interval. So if you look at 
this scatter plot, you can see that 8.30 is a particularly difficult time for this student. Uh, and then the period from 9 to 9.30, maybe a little less so. But we would really want to look at what's happening at 8.30. And here's another example where we have the day just divided up into activities. This tends to be more the way I do it. I look, I put the student schedule on a scatter plot and then I'll um, collect data for about a week or so. What this helps me do is it helps me narrow down when I would want to do some more in-depth observations. Doing direct observation is time consuming and it's more useful if you're actually going to see a lot of occurrences of a behavior. So you want to identify some times when it's going to be most useful for you to get this data. You can also begin at this point to make some uh, hypotheses about uh, you know, what is it about circle time? Is it the fact that you've got a lot of kids sitting in close proximity? Is it the nature of the demands? Or sometimes it may be that a student has to wait while other kids take turns. I mean, it could be any of those factors that you would want to look at more closely. So to make a scatter plot, you first of all make a grid. You decide um, how you're going to divide up the day. Are you going to do it in half hour increments? Or are you going to base it on the student's schedule? And then you just record uh, the behavior, if it happens within that interval or not. Sometimes you'll do a code, uh, one slash diagonally if it happens once, and then you'll do a second slash to make an X if it happens more than once. And if it happens more than twice, you just fill in the block. That's uh, pretty easy to do, and it gives you information that is a little more detailed than just did it occur or not. I mean the advantages of a scatter plot are that it's really easy to do. It is a form of direct observation but it's probably one of the simplest forms. It's also easy to analyze the data. You simply look at the scatter plot, do you see patterns across time of a day? So it gives you some information very easily, and it's very accessible information. Some of the cons are the fact that even though you get some information, it's not very specific. You do need some training to fill it out correctly. Uh, more specifically, the people who uh, fill it out need to understand the definition of the target behavior. If you don't have a good definition of a behavior, then the, the data is not going to be very useful. That's true of any kind of data collection though. Because it's partial interval, it's all or nothing, it doesn't really distinguish between behaviors that happen at a really high rate or behaviors that happen at a really low rate. So again, it's not real specific. I always consider a scatter plot as a starting point. So if you're not sure about patterns of the day, uh, it's a good way just to get that information before you proceed with other kinds of data collection. Now we get into looking more specifically at antecedents and consequences of behavior. In the last presentation we talked briefly about ABC recording. ABC recording has been around for a long time. It's attributed to a person by the name of Sidney Bijou he first wrote an article describing it in 1968, so it's, it's been around for quite a while. And there's a reason that it's still used. It's very useful. It, give, it can give you some very good information, but it's a bit labor-intensive. Then we're going to talk about something called the Functional Assessment Direct Observation Form, the FADO. This was developed by Rob O'Neill, who is currently at the University of Utah. And this is a method that I was trained in uh, for a number of years. It's my personal favorite, and I think it's extremely useful. And then we'll talk about some methods of collecting data for setting events. ABC recording uh, is event recording. It's not going to give you details about the duration of a behavior. So if you're looking at something like off-task behavior, it's a good idea to collect some other data at the same time. Um, for example, I often will use momentary time sampling uh, 
for on-task and off-task behavior at the same time I'm collecting some ABC recording data. It does give you some good information about how a behavior fits into a context or the sequence of events as they occur. So it gives you information about um, the behavior, what was going on, and then what happened immediately after the behavior. You can use that to untangle antecedents and consequences of a behavior. It takes a lot of time and it's a lot of writing. And sometimes things happen really quickly and it's hard to get information down. Unless you have a lot of experience, it can also become very confusing. You know, what's an antecedent, what's a consequence? You know, sometimes the consequence of one behavior actually is the antecedent for another behavior. Uh, an example of that would be a uh, student uh, is disruptive. The teacher comes over and gives the student a command as a result of the behavior. So the demand, the teacher coming over, is the consequence of the disruptive behavior. But when the uh, teacher gives a demand, then the student might yell a obscenity at her. Well, the antecedent of the obscenity is the teacher's um, redirection or demand, which was the consequence of the previous behavior. See what I mean? It can get a little confusing. Um, practice helps though. Also, it's extremely important. You really appreciate a good definition of a target behavior when you start collecting this kind of data. The behavior really becomes the anchor. It's the first thing you write down because you really don't have an antecedent until you have a behavior that goes with it. And then the consequence is what follows the behavior. Here's just a quick example. With ABC recording, I find it really useful to write the time. And I'll also make a separate column for the setting. And this usually doesn't change with every occurrence. So I know it has uh, math seat work, but I just may do a couple of ditto marks just to show that this didn't change. The first thing you write down is the behavior column. Again, because really the behavior defines or anchors the antecedent and the uh, consequence. So you write down, Tom says no. Then you write down what was going on. Well, it was when the teacher gave him a sheet. And what was the consequence? The teacher looked at him or glared at him. That was the consequence of the behavior. So you just continue with this form, uh, writing down things as they occur. My problem is when I start writing really quickly, it gets really messy. And uh, it's hard for me even to go back and read it. Some people can write quickly, more legibly. Um, they may find this more useful than I do. So I tend to use ABC recording only when I go into a situation and I haven't had a chance to plan ahead of time. Um, I prefer other methods, and we'll, I'll explain why. The method that I like uh, and I use more is the functional assessment direct observation form or the the FADO. It gives you the same information that an ABC recording sheet does but I think it has a number of advantages. It does require you to plan though because you have to enter in target behaviors, possible antecedents, and possible consequences ahead of time. You set up the data sheet and you score it by entering numbers onto a grid. Because you're not writing a lot, you can do it very quickly and you can actually do it while you're doing something else. You know, it's easy just to, to write some numbers down. You can, because you can do it so quickly, you can also keep up with a rapid flow of events and I find that really useful in some situations. You would only do this after you do an interview or a scatter plot or possibly the motivation assessment scale or some other rating scale. Again, I tend not to use those because I don't find them that useful. But after the interview, you've got a hypothesis statement. You use that to set up the, the sheet. It's just a grid like this. Um, this one, you would list different behaviors in uh, the left column. So you have different behaviors listed. And then what are the antecedents that are consistent with your hypothesis? You would list those. And then 
what are the possible consequences? So you might fill in some things like escaped the demand, uh, got adult attention, got peer attention, um, things like that. Then on the left column, I usually just put in the student schedule. Or like the scatter plot, you can divide the, this into half hour increments as well. It's pretty flexible. I tend to go more with the student schedule. This is not something that I do for an entire day either. I would use a scatter plot to pick out times of the day when the behavior was really likely to occur. And that's when I would focus my observation time. Because you're only writing numbers down, you can do this really quickly. So you can do it while you're teaching. You may not be able to write it down as soon as the behavior happens, but just as, as quickly as you can, you're jotting down a number a few times. And we'll take a look at how you actually use this sheet. The information that you get from it, you get frequency of a behavior because you're, put, you're coding a behavior every time it happens. You're also getting the time and the setting because you've entered the schedule on the left-hand margin. You're not going to know the exact time, but if you break it down into half-hour increments, you're going to know within a half-hour, you're certainly going to know the period or type of instruction that was going on. If you suspect some setting events are involved, you can simply create another column for setting events and code those as well. It's just a table in a Microsoft Word file, so you can customize it very easily. You always have a section for antecedents, and you always have a section for uh, consequences. Sometimes I will add another column of something I call perceived function. Here, you might put in, uh, you know, the perceived function was escape. The actual consequence might be that the student was sent into timeout. Here's an example just at the top of the sheet with some information filled in. On this example, we think there may be some setting events, so we've added a section with three possible setting events. Is the student alone? Is the student in a small group or in a large group? Then we've got some different antecedents. We suspect that this behavior is occurring to escape demands. So we've entered demand slash request as an antecedent. We also have some other things that may be antecedents, interactions with peers or interactions with adults. But we're not quite sure. We weren't able to narrow things down with our hypothesis statement. So now we're doing some direct observation to test it out. The behaviors that we're concerned about are aggression or doing something other than following a direction when it's given. And that's how we've defined noncompliance. And being out of seat. And then the consequences, we have redirection, a warning or reprimand, interaction with adult, and interaction with peer. And these are possible functions of behavior. Function might be um, adult attention or peer attention, based on our hypothesis. If you notice down at the bottom, we've got some numbers that go 1 through 13, all the way across the bottom. These numbers help us keep track of our scoring system. Um, we're going to use the number one for the first occurrence of a behavior. And we'll put a number one in the column underneath the behavior and in the row that corresponds to the time period when the behavior occurs. Once we use the number one, we're going to cross it off on that um, section at the bottom to indicate that we've used that number and we're not going to use it again. We'll use the number 2 to code the next occurrence of a behavior. We'll put it in the column under the behavior and again in the row that corresponds to the time period. In addition to using the numbers to code the behavior, we're going to use that same number in every column that's relevant. So let's say if the student was aggressive during the first time period, I'm going to use the number 1 under aggression in that first row under the column under aggression. I'm also going to put the number one under whatever setting event that was relevant. So let's say it happened in a small group. I'm going to put a number one under small group. And it happened when I gave a demand. I'm going to put a number one under demand. And when the student was aggressive, I went over and I redirected him. 
So I'm going to put a 1 under redirect in the consequence column. Then I'm going to cross off the number 1 at the bottom to indicate that I've used it. Now what this does, I can look at this later and I can see during that 30 minute period the kid was aggressive, the kid was aggressive during small group instruction when I gave him a demand and the consequence was he received redirection. And I know all that just from the number one written under those different columns. So it's a lot of information with very little writing or data entry. And that's one of the reasons I find it extremely useful. It helps to actually look at it. So look at this example. This would tell me, you know, on the left, of course, we would actually write in what's going on. So I know that during that first time period, um, the student was non-compliant. I know that it happened during small group instruction when the student was given a demand and it resulted in a warning or reprimand. And then I know the next behavior occurred in the next 30 minute time slot. The student was out of his seat and he was out of his seat during small group instruction. None of, the, uh, none of those antecedents really were relevant so one wasn't coded it looks like. I think that was just a mistake on my part. There should be something in the antecedent column. Um, let's say that it was uh, interaction with an adult. So there should be a two there. And then in the consequence column, we have the student was redirected, number two. Then we cross off number two down at the bottom under next to events. Well, let's say that nothing else occurred that day. At the end of the day, I'm just going to make a slash mark, and then I'm going to put the date which in this case would be September 2nd. The next day I can use this same data sheet. I can use it for several days. But on the second day, since I've already used the numbers 1 and 2, I'm going to start with the number 3. So let's say that this data sheet is telling me that no behavior occurred on the second day until the third 30-minute time slot. The student was aggressive, and the student was aggressive when a demand was given and it happened to be in a large group activity and I know that when the student was aggressive he got a warning or a reprimand. I also know that no other issue or no other target behavior occurred that day but on the next day on September 4th there was one occurrence and that's coded with the number four. Um, if the number, if on that third day if the student had engaged in out-of-seat behavior during the first 30 minutes, that number four would be up in that first row. It's just coincidental that they drop down the way they do. I mean, it's just telling me that on the third day, it happened during that first to the fourth 30 minute slot. So this is the way it works. It's just you just use numbers and you enter a number under each relevant column. So the steps is you fill in the information at the top it's really important that you have the right information at the top. It's not very useful if you just write in random antecedents and consequences. You really have to start with a good hypothesis statement. So you fill in the information, then you observe the behavior, you code in using the numbering system. It takes a little practice and it's a little confusing to begin with, but it's very easy to use once you're used to it. Just always remember to mark off the number at the bottom once you've used it and then use the next number in the sequence. It's good if you can get 10 to 15 occurrences on the data sheet. That allows you to, to begin to see clusters of behavior forming. We'll look at an apple. Um, remember this is going to give you frequency data. If you need duration data, you may have to collect some additional data. Um, also, if you're looking at uh, something like a student um, answering questions, you know, something based on trials or opportunities, you may have to collect some additional data for that as well. But what you're, you're um, looking at is does the behavior that you have recorded fit your hypothesis from your interview? Does it match it? Does it support your hypothesis? Or does it suggest something else? I almost always end up fine-tuning my hypothesis after I do some direct observation. Here's an example of a sheet that's been completed. It doesn't have the numbers at the bottom that have been marked off. They 
got cut off when I transferred it, unfortunately. Here we don't really have a column for setting events, and because you're not always going to suspect setting events are involved. But we have the behaviors, the antecedents, and the consequences. This is the way I usually make the sheet, because the behavior is actually the first thing you record anyway. And then you record what was going on when the behavior occurred, and then you record what happened immediately after the behavior. So I know from this example that during the opening activity, the student hit someone. That was the number one recording. It happened during a group activity, and it resulted in that student escaping from the demand. So if I continue to collect this data over several days, I start to look for clustering, and I see that I've got two target behaviors that happen the most are hitting and throwing objects. And it looks like hitting usually occurs during group activity, and throwing objects usually happens during an independent activity. Hitting usually results in an escape from demand, and throwing objects usually results in teacher attention. So just real quickly looking at this would suggest to me that one behavior is occurring to escape a demand, the other behavior is occurring to escape, uh, or, or the other behavior, throwing objects, is occurring to obtain teacher attention. Based on this information, I might uh, revise my hypothesis statements so that now I have two different behaviors, each serving a different function. When do you use the FADO? Well, you certainly use it after you've got some kind of um, hypothesis statement. You want to narrow down antecedents and consequences. It works better for behaviors that are higher frequency. Um, you know, if you've got something that happens a number of times per day, you're going to get information more quickly. I have used this with low frequency behaviors. It's just going to take you longer to get enough information that's going to make some sense. You can use this for short probes if you've got a behavior that happens a lot. You know, for example, a behavior that happens, you know, 10 or 15 times within an hour, you would probably only focus on certain periods of the day. If you've got a behavior that only happens a few times a day, you may want to collect this kind of data throughout the day over several days. You really need, you know, at least 10 occurrences before you can really make any sense of it. Let's talk briefly about setting events. Um, we saw in the first example we had a column in the FADO for setting events. Sometimes it's useful just to make a different checklist for setting events. Remember, setting events are things that may affect a behavior, but they are not necessarily things that happen in the immediate situation where the behavior is occurring. So it could be a social event like an argument with a peer or a change in teacher. Or it could be a biological state, like the student being sick or having an issues with allergies. Sometimes with kids on the autism spectrum, it might be uh, a crowdy environment or uh, a crowded environment or a lot of noise. So these are things, what a setting event does is it changes the relationship between the antecedent, the behavior, and the consequence. Uh, for example, if a student comes to school and that kid did not sleep the night before and just really feels bad, you may give the student a demand to do a difficult task, and that student may react differently than he or she has before. The reason they're doing that is that demand you've given them is more aversive and they're more motivated to escape it. So the antecedent is still the demand. But the setting event of being up all night the night before changes the nature of the relationship with that demand and the consequence of escape, so that now they're more motivated to escape. That's how setting events work. They'll, they'll affect behavior. They tend to be all or nothing. In other words, they're either in place or they're not. It's not something that's going to be in effect for part of the day and not in effect the rest of the day. For that reason, it's usually helpful just to make some kind of checklist. You can include them um, as part of the FADO, or you can make a little entry on a ABC chart.
Usually you get the idea that you may have a setting event from your interview information. Or sometimes if you look at a scatter plot and you see that the student has more difficulty on some days than others. If I see a graph of a student's behavior with a lot of spikes, you know, like some days it's really awful and other days there's just not much of a problem, I immediately suspect there may be some kind of setting event involved and I want to take a look at that further. To make a checklist, you just list possible setting events and then you just indicate on the checklist if they happened or didn't happen. You want to keep it somewhere that you can get to it really easily. Sometimes these might be sheets that you would ask parents to keep at home or you may ask parents to communicate something to you that you can record onto a sheet once the student gets to school. These are just some examples of um, things you might look at with setting events. You know, you could um, have an, an infinite number of, of possible uh, issues. It's very individualized and it's going to depend on that student. Here's an example of how you can use a scatter plot. You can use uh, the MAS, Motivation Assessment Scale. Some of the questions relate to setting events. So if you are someone who uses the, the MAS, um, these are certain questions that you, you might take a look at. Again, I'm not a big proponent of that instrument. I get more information from interviews. So from an interview, I might get information that would indicate that if the student sleeps less than four hours or misses breakfast or has an argument with mom in the morning uh, or has an issue on the school bus or gets to school late, they all may be issues that affect that student's behavior for the rest of the day. So I may just keep track of that information for a period of days. So I could do a simple checklist like this. This is what I would use most often. Or you could even do something like this and just circle yes or no. You know, did the event happen that day or not? Then I want to look at occurrences of the behaviors and how that relates to the occurrence of a setting event. So I do a two by two table like this. On the rows, I'm going to indicate the setting event occurred or the setting event didn't occur. And then in the columns, the behavior occurred, the behavior did not occur. What I'm looking for is do I see a high number in cell A that's a lot bigger than cell B, C, or D? If I see that it's just as likely that the behavior occurred when the setting event did or did not occur, uh, that's going to suggest that it's really not something that's relevant for that kid. Looking at uh, behavior this way or looking at setting events and behavior in this way can be extremely informative and it can indicate, um, help you really narrow down what factors are affecting a student's behavior. So this would be an example of looking at whether or not the student slept four hours or not and we see that there's, there are much more occurrences of behavior when the student got uh, less than four hours of sleep. This would indicate that this may be a setting event. So to sum up chatting, uh, setting event checklist, the advantages are they're really good at looking at setting events that you think are most likely to affect a behavior. They can give you some information about the context, uh, context of, of a behavior. And they can also be useful for communication between home and school. The disadvantages are by themselves, they're not really going to show you the function of a behavior. So you need to do this in addition to some
indirect and direct functional assessment observations. It's also not going to be a useful data collection tool for looking at the frequency of a behavior or it's not going to show you things that have been done to address a behavior in the past. It has a very specific purpose and when you design them well, they serve that purpose very well.